said, you know, as I drive across country, it certainly is something that um, it's very much in our popular press in, in every in every possible way. Like I said, when I went to Starbucks um, and couldn't fill my personal cup, I knew that was because of the coronavirus scare. Um, additionally, um, this morning at the hotel, I saw on when I logged into the hotel's internet um, on the top, it said, you know, those visitors who are coming from China or Korea um, will get their money back on their hotel reservations because, of course, they're not allowed to travel. Um, so we're seeing all of these things around us every day. So what I wanted to talk about is a little bit of the microbiology of coronaviruses. They're actually very common viruses. And you may remember in 2003, um, I think some of you were probably born at that time um, that we had an, another coronavirus scare. It was SARS or Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. They've actually avoided calling this particular virus SARS just because of the um, memories associated with that, um, with that particular um, scare. So coronaviruses are enveloped viruses, and what that means is they have actually a phospholipid um, layer uh, surrounding them. Um, and then inside the genome of a coronavirus is a single-stranded positive sense RNA virus. And I want you to think about what that means to be a positive sense RNA. So ponder that for me for a moment. Um, corona means crown. Um, and in fact, coronaviruses were named that because they resemble um, the spikes on the virus, resemble the solar corona on the sun. And so this is the root of the name. So you can see in this image, which was published in 2009 when they elucidated the structure of the virion. We call it a virion when it's outside of the host. Um, so the virion is what we would be studying um, when we study the virus all by itself, not inside of its host. So in PNAS, this was published in 2009. And what you notice is that it has these very large spikes. And that gives it the sort of quintessential look that it has. And the S protein is a famous spike on the virion. It is actually the spike that binds to the surface of the host cell and allows the virus to gain entry into the host cell. There are other components as well. Um, including a, um, a membrane pr uh, protein, glycoprotein called M, and an envelope protein called E. Um, these are all encoded for by the virus itself. So uh, let's zoom in and look inside so that we can look at the genome. Remember that it is, I said it is a plus sense RNA. And actually, I should take that from you all. Um, what does it mean to be a plus RNA? What would, why, what would be different if it were a minus or a negative sense? We say positive sense, negative sense. Does anybody know what that refers to? Someone says, is it like a charge? Okay, good, I like that. Is it a charge? That's a really good guess. Um, but instead, what it has to do with is the directionality of it. So um, remember when we talked about DNA? Uh, DNA has a coding strand and a template strand, or a five prime to three prime strand, and a three prime to five prime strand. Strand. We call the five prime to three prime strand the plus strand, and the uh, three prime to five prime strand we call it the minus strand. So when we talk about a plus RNA, it means it's a five prime to three prime RNA. The cool thing about that is that it means that for this virus, its genome looks very much like the mRNAs in our body. So that behooves the virus because the body looks at it and it says, whoa, hey, that's just one of my own mRNAs. I need to convert that into protein. And it does. And in fact, the virus even has these areas that look familiar, like the five prime methylated cap of an mRNA and the three prime poly A tail. So it's like the, when this gets into our host cells, 
our cells look at it and they say, that's one of my mRNAs, one of my messenger RNAs. I need to translate that. And, and so the ribosomes will bind to it and they will translate it to make the products of the virus. And those products are um, a, a gene product that uh, encodes for the enzymes to replicate the viral genome. So the first gene is the largest one, uh, encompass, encompasses about two thirds of the, the total um, uh, RNA and it encodes for the, the replication of the virus. And then the genes downstream from there are the genes that encode for things like the S protein, the, the spike that sticks out from the virus and the E protein of the envelope and all of the things that make the virion, the virion. And then at the end, look, it even has a poly A tail, just like our mRNA. So it, this is a very smooth, I like to say viruses like this are smooth criminals because they trick our body um, into thinking this looks like them. And, and what's, e what's all the more is that um, coronaviruses actually have the largest known viral genome, known, that is to say, right? Uh, approximately 30 kilobases. So a very large genome um, for, for a virus, which means that the capsid has to also be pretty large. That is the, the virion itself, right? To hold all of that um, RNA, lots and lots of RNA. So one of you had asked about um, viral latency. You left a question behind. Um, and this isn't a virus that integrates into the host cell chromosome. There are some that do do that, um, such as HIV, uh, such as herpes virus. Um, and so a little bit different than a coronavirus. So uh, when a coronavirus um, binds to the surface of the cell, the S protein is um, the protein that allows that binding to take place. Now, remember that the, the, the receptor, these are peptidase proteins on the surface of our cells, um, those are not there for the virus. The virus is exploiting them. It's binding to, to them and, and it's confusing the cells. The cells think that they're binding to something they need, but instead they're binding to a virus. And that triggers one of two things. Um, coronaviruses either, because they have a bilayer a membrane around them, uh, they have that envelope, we call it an envelope with viruses. They can actually literally fuse with the host cell uh, membrane. And you can see here, this is kind of showing that fusion event. And then the RNA can just pop out into the cytosol. Um, that is one way they can get in. Another way is to trigger endocytosis, and this is an endosome here, um, that, that then the virus envelope can merge with the endosome membrane and boop, pop out that plus sense RNA, that five prime to three prime RNA. Um, and then of course, then that can, can further encode for the proteins. Um, and when the virus leaves the cell, it, because, uh, it is in a vesicle, it can just be popped out really easily um, from, you know, just through exocytosis. So it's a pretty smooth criminal. Um, and, and so I, I want to end today by talking a little bit about the history and perspective. Um, while coronaviruses have been arguably, arguably around for much longer, they were first isolated in 1937. Um, we do say that they are zoonoses um, or they are zoonotic. What that does mean is that they um, can be transmitted from another species to the human species or that they do, um, that they do exist in, in, in multiple species. They, they can replicate, they can replicate in multiple species. Um, but the move from one species to another species is something that is slow. Um, there are four major categories called the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, and they are respiratory viruses. So you've seen this, and you might remember that the iconic image of the SARS was people wearing a mask, and that's to prevent the droplets. So the mask is not small enough to prevent, say, the virus, if the virus were alone from getting through. But when it's on, and it is when you sneeze or cough and it's on a respiratory droplet, it does stop the droplets. So that's one way that if you are sick, you can prevent that. 
um, from being transmitted. Um, so that's one of the, the, th the images that we tend to see a lot of. Um, so uh, it is interesting to note that coronaviruses are all around us all the time. They cause about 10 to 30 percent of what we call the cold. Um, so you get a cold, you know, there's, there are coronaviruses that cause that. But these more severe pneumonia um, outcomes of coronavirus are, are more rare. Although, uh, if you've heard of SARS, you may have also heard of MERS, M-E-R-S. Um, which is still causing human cases now. Um, it's been around for a while. So there are seven human coronaviruses that have been typified. Uh, you can find out more of these, but the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, that one's the MERS, the M-E-R-S. Um, so um, that being said, uh, let's take a look at perspective just a little bit. Um, and, uh, oh, and I should say too, yesterday, uh, as I was driving and checking my email, well, not while I was driving, I was riding the passenger seat, and um, in pops this notification. I get all the notifications from NSF, which is not a bad idea. If you're just wanting to be like nerd out, get uh, registered to get the NSF emails. It's really cool to see what's going on um, in the National Science Foundation funding and, and, and the projects that are coming out of NSF project but they are putting out a special call right now for research related to coronavirus, which means that scientists everywhere are quickly trying to think about ways that we can respond um, to further coronavirus outbreaks, including the current one. Um, and active research is happening all the time. Um, so some sources that you may have already been aware of or that you wanna, might wanna check out um, the World Health Organization puts a map out there that shows you where the current cases are, um, where they've been confirmed, um, and maybe where they also have not been confirmed. So you can keep an eye on that map and, and where they're present. And this is updated. It was updated 24 hours ago when I got it uh, today. Um, so, or the, actually that one was March 5th. This one was 24 hours ago. Um, so these are the number of cases in China. Uh, 80, just uh, about 80, 81,000, 8,565, 3,000 deaths. Uh, outside of China, only um, 267 deaths um, that uh, 53 new were reported in the last 24 hours. Um, so this just kind of gives you a sense of where the risk assessment is, where the cases are. I really like the World Health Organization website. I highly suggest it. Um, I'm even a little more preferential to it than the Centers for Disease Control, but the CDCs is also another really good site to help keep you updated and maybe share with family members as well. Um, but I wanted to also show you this just for a little bit of perspective. So this is no longer talking about the COVID. This is now talking about the influenza. So this is the 2019 influenza. Um, these are, this is estimated beginning in October 1st of this year till current. So these are just the number of cases of influenza, the regular flu, the number of deaths um, ranging between 18 and 46,000 um, deaths and um, uh, as many as half a million uh, hospitalizations with that. Um, so I think this is just helps with relative perspective in looking at how the influenza compares with our current uh, COVID situation. Um, and I have a bunch of resources that I've linked on here. I will share these slides with you so that you can have them. I really liked this um, article in um, this journal article that I've provided the DOI for in the methods of molecular biology. It really reviews uh, coronaviruses at length and um, you might want to nerd out with it this weekend. Um, this gives the link also to the World Health Organization, the Centers for Disease Control, um, the ASM has also done some updates as well. Um, on the World Health Organization, there was a statement from the head of WHO, um, kind of just giving a situation report. There's daily situation reports that you can access on there. So it can be uh, additional things to watch. And maybe, I know sometimes it's hard not to just get caught up in reading the news, but these are good places to go um, for your, your more reputable resources that maybe will give you um, 
the science behind what's going on and maybe help shed perspective on, on everything. I'm sure you saw the email that also comes, came through the university today that the university is taking all manner of precautions um, <laughs> and, and just keeping you up to date with situations as they exist when and if they do exist in Wyoming, not currently. Okay, so I, I, I know there was a lot to say, but I just felt that it was important to me um, to, to share a little bit about, and by no means, right, by no means did I exhaustively review everything out there about coronavirus, um, and I'll leave that for you, you to do.